And now we finally arrived. We're looking at the statue of Paul Revere that commemorates his fateful ride. Leaving on the night of the 18th of April in 1775. Now, this statue, as wonderful as it is, commemorates more the location, which you see behind me there, the Old North Church. That is the very church, the very steeple, where the lanterns were placed that marked one if by land and two if by sea. And as you already know, there were two lanterns placed in that steeple that night. And here we are, the Old North Church, established in 1723. That makes it exactly 102 years after that first Thanksgiving that I did a video on before. This church then is already well into multiple decades of existence by the time the revolution is afoot. And by the time that Paul Revere is considering, after having been involved in the local spy band, is considering reporting on the activities of the British regulars in order to protect the powder, guns, and armaments stored at Concord and throughout that region. Good morning, everyone. James McQuivy. Welcome to the Year of Living Manly. We are now in part two of my series on the Men of Freedom, tied, of course, to just this last week when we celebrated or observed Patriots Day here in Boston, the day that the battles of Lexington and Concord occurred. Now, I'm going to go into much more detail on these battles. Uh, I got us in our last video all the way up to April 18th, 1775. This is right before Paul Revere is about to get on his horse and ride out to Lexington and Concord. There I will introduce you, and today in this video I will introduce you to the first of the four men of freedom that I've decided to focus on as part of my effort to understand what it means to be a man. I'm standing outside my home today because, yes, I'm proudly flying this flag that represents so much, and that is the legacy that we inherit from Patriots Day, but I'm also outside because it is a beautiful New England spring day. You got to see our weeping cherry tree in the back before, and if you maybe listen, you can hear the woodpecker over there, an owl over there, and then just the bird song all around. It's a wonderful time to be in New England, the three weeks that we call spring. <laughs> But what I'm really here to do is tell you the story of April 18th, 1775. Now, in the last video, as I said, I got you up to the point where, here's what we know. The British are intent on seizing powder and arms. Uh, now, when I say arms, I'm really referring to cannon. Um, and cannon, for whatever reason, when they refer to cannon, it's always in the singular, even though my brain wants to say cannons. Interesting linguistic fact. Uh, but it is the cannons that have been distributed all throughout uh, the area. So um, as I talked about in the last video, the powder alarm of late 1774 was the first time when the British under Thomas Gage, the general of the army, as well as the governor of the territory, uh, where they first went out and tried to capture or seize cannon, powder, we're now to a point where the colonists are more unified than they ever have been. So this is city folk as well as town folk alike. This is what caused Gage to write back to the British crown and say, you need to send more reinforcements. We need to bring more soldiers here because there is now a, a readiness on the part of the people here to do more than they ever have before. This is a recipe for incredible conflict. Just think about it. We've got, uh, now spies, a band of spies in Boston proper, um, of which Paul Revere is one. Uh, this is an individual living in the middle of Boston, which is now an occupied town where a lot of the colonists have fled the town. Um, and Gage has quartered more and more troops there. Uh, these are faithful to the cause of liberty, these individuals, but their careful monitoring of the actions and the communications of the uh, British troop plans, this is what serves as the crucial step to get everybody ready for uh, what happens on Patriots Day. Now, conversely, the British leadership also has spies, uh, some of them among the Sons of Liberty, to the degree highly placed enough where we would later look back and say, how do we not know <laughs> that these were spies. But anyway, this is how they knew that there was powder and cannon out at Concord um, and that they knew that, that it was time to go out and seize it. It's also how they knew 
that the low, uh, that Sam Adams and John Hancock, two leaders of the Sons of Liberty, uh, were out in Lexington, adjacent to uh, Concord, and thus essentially putting General Gage in a position where he could request for and receive permission both to go capture the arms and to arrest those two men. That's the situation leading up to April 18th, the evening when Paul Revere is now saddling up his horse and getting ready to ride. The communication plan had three parts. Part one, send rider William Dawes on horseback from Boston across the Boston Neck. Now this is a narrow neck of land that connects Boston, which is essentially an island in the middle of the harbor. I'll, sh I'll show you that a little bit later on. To ride around to the southwest and then up back around to meet in Lexington. He was option one. Option two is Revere. Revere is going to row across the harbor to Charleston, and as I'll show you, and from there, get on a horse prepared by some of his allies to get up to Lexington as well. Either one of them could have been arrested. It was illegal for either one of them to be out after curfew in Boston. So if they didn't make it, the third option was, let's hang some lanterns from the belfry, or I keep saying the steeple, in the Old North Church, which was Christ Church congregation. Uh, we refer to it as the Old North Church today. Um, that was the backup plan. It, one of the things that gets confusing is that a lot of people think, oh, Paul Revere was sitting around waiting for the lanterns, the lanterns go and he gets on the horse. No, he actually stopped by the church and said, go hang the lanterns. And then he went back to his house, got a couple of things, walked back down the hill to the waterfront, rode across the water, got on a horse that was waiting for him there. So a little bit different than maybe we've conceived of it after just reading the poem or hearing the basic story. Behind me at this exceedingly awkward angle, you can see the steeple itself reaching up and revealing the place where those lanterns would have been hung. Now, one of the things you need to realize is that today when you approach Boston, from really 50 miles away at night, you see the glow of the city. But this is pre-electricity. Not only that, it's pre-kerosene. We're talking, these lanterns probably would have been lit, and I haven't checked this, but probably by paraffin, maybe beeswax. Here I am outside the Concord Museum in Concord, Massachusetts. I came here because actually on the inside, in a wonderful display, they have one of the lanterns that is alleged to be one of the lanterns hung in the belfry on that night on April 18th. One of the lanterns that just for a brief few minutes signaled across the water to Charleston that the British were going to indeed come by sea. I wanted to come look at it because I couldn't find any description of how the lantern was lit. I had assumed and made mention of that, that it was possibly an oil-based lantern. It is not. It is a candle lantern. So two candles held up in a belfry for a brief few minutes were the signal that was supposed to be the backup in case Revere and Dawes didn't get their message across the water. Boy, relying on candles. It's amazing that any of this ever happened. It all means that those lanterns wouldn't have been very bright, but there wouldn't have been other light sources to compete with that night, especially at about 8.30 when the signal was first given and Paul Revere could decide it was time to go fetch a few things from his home and then begin his ride. Let me take advantage of this wall-sized map in the basement of Faneuil Hall, since it's kind of quiet here today, to show you what Boston used to look like. Now, we're looking here at Boston. Boston used to be connected to land by this very narrow neck and was basically an island. You can see how it's structured like an island. Now you go through Boston, Boston Common, you get up to this area called the North End. That is where we saw um, Paul Revere statue. That's where the Old North Church is located. Now, today you don't realize this because uh, it seems like, oh, we've got bridges to Charleston, we've got land filled in around Cambridge, but actually this part of Boston was kind of isolated. So when uh, when Paul Revere goes down to the shore and a couple of friends row him across to Charleston so he can get an advantage over the British, who, by the way, are going to take all their soldiers down this way and go over here. So it's going to be dramatically longer and harder for them, and of course they're 700 men, so it's going to be harder for them to get across. So uh, Revere has plenty of time. It's 9 o'clock at night by the time he gets over here in Charleston and is able to begin his ride up the neck through Cambridge and on his way out to Lexington. 
if you get a chance to come to Concord, you want to come to the Concord Museum where they have the absolute best video depiction of the events of Patriot's Day. And, of course, also one of the lanterns allegedly used in the actual Old North Church, one if by land, two if by sea signal. As it would turn out, the backup plan of the lanterns, though poetically inspiring to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in later years, turned out to be unnecessary. Revere and Oz both make it out of Boston. Both were able to ride through the countryside on their way to Concord. Now, converging in Lexington at about midnight. So what we call the midnight ride of Paul Revere was actually the late evening ride of Paul Revere and William Dawes, but that's less poetic. Both men made it to Lexington, just seven miles short of Concord, where they successfully warned Samuel Adams and um, John Hancock that they were targeted for arrest that evening. Both men fled the area and evaded capture that night. Now, this is crucial. Having succeeded in this first purpose, now Revere and Oz can continue their ride along this, the Battle Road, as we call it today, the road from Lexington through Lincoln into Concord. As they cross through Lincoln, they start stopping at homes, it's midnight, remember, to uh, awake the residents and warn them that this is coming. And uh, along the way, they encounter Dr. Samuel Prescott. Now, it's almost one in the morning at this point, and he's on the road riding back to his home in Concord from Lexington in the middle of the night. And they very quickly determine that he is, in fact, I'm going to quote him, a high son of liberty. This is what Revere would later testify. When Prescott heard of their mission, he asked to join them so that he could help sound the alarm. Now, this made a lot of sense because he's from Concord. At this point, Revere had been out to Concord a couple of times to warn people that something like this might happen, but they didn't necessarily know him. Prescott, on the other hand, was a local citizen. So for him to say, let me go with you and I'll warn people as well, was actually a great help. Now along the road, somewhere around or after 1 a.m., they're intercepted by a British patrol. And this is where things get challenging. This is a patrol specifically sent out to guard against exactly this. Uh, any men that might be riding through the countryside warning people of the imminent arrival of the main body of troops. I'm here at the very site where that interception occurred as is commemorated by this plaque and this resting spot along the road uh, to Concord. This is where Revere, interestingly, had separated a little bit because uh, Dawes and their new companion, Prescott, were further down the road. Um, they were at a house trying to awaken and alert the members of the household. Meanwhile, Revere was further up the road here at this location and as a result was apprehended by a group of troops who were patrolling the area to try to identify anyone who might be uh, spying on troops and communicating troop movements. Well, of course, that's exactly what Revere was doing. And so they arrest him. He doesn't tell them he was doing that. Interestingly, Dawes sees what's going on and Dawes says, Oh, goodness. <laughs> he, he turns his horse the other way and heads back in the direction of Lexington. Now, in fleeing, he actually uh, gets uh, dismounted from his horse, loses his horse, and has to walk the rest of the way. What's so interesting about Prescott is that he does exactly the opposite. Dawes is at least safe after, you know, a long night's ride and trying to warn people in the countryside. He has made himself safe. Prescott, on the other hand, decides to ride out to where Revere is being interrogated by the troops and see what's going on. Takes himself right up to the group, is then also taken and uh, ordered at gunpoint into a field somewhere. Let's just imagine it's over here along the side of the road. And uh, while that's happening, when Prescott gets to a point where he sees that the coast might be clear for an escape, he yells, put on which I imagine is a command to his horse. I don't know horses, and I don't know 1775 horse, com horse conversation. But he yells, put on, and both Revere and he try to dash out. They're still on horseback. Revere goes one way, Prescott goes the other way. Revere is going to end up getting himself into a dead end. He's not going to successfully evade capture. They're going to find him and capture him, 
and then uh, take him off his horse and ride him back in the direction of Lexington where they don't know what to do with him because he hasn't really committed a crime that they are aware of because he's not confessing. But at the same time, Prescott successfully, according to Revere, who is really the only eyewitness because Prescott never said anything or wrote this down, Revere says he successfully on his horse jumped over a stone fence and dashed away into the countryside. Now we know he was successful because he's the one who then within half an hour is going further down the road from Lexington to Concord, waking people up, telling them to spread the alarm. There's a famous tavern down the road that he wakes up the families. They send out their family members and friends in every direction. So they're spreading the alarm further and further in every direction. And that's exactly what needed to happen. So ironically, the midnight ride of Paul Revere ends with Revere arrested and walked back to Lexington, but ends also with this newcomer who wasn't part of the plan at all, Prescott, who goes on to Concord and continues on all the way to Concord and is successfully able to rouse the town. They know who he is. He tells them the events of the night and they are able to ring the Concord bells and now send even more messengers in every direction, including to the town of Acton, where the militia of Acton is easily roused and brought to Concord and they are going to play a very crucial role in what happens later that day at the bridge in Concord. And this is where I want to introduce you to the first of my four men of freedom in this small look into the lives of men who were crucial to the success of the American Revolutionary War, but who we don't really know. I've been talking all this time about Revere, Sam Adams, John Hancock, even Thomas Gage. These are individuals that we all know and history has recorded. But Dr. Samuel Prescott, well, he's a complete unknown. All we know is that he was born in 1751. He was born to a family that had lived here in Concord for generations at that point. We know that at this point now he's in his mid-twenties and he is a doctor, but we don't really know of what. In fact, there is so little that we understand about this man. It's a surprise we even know his name at all, were it not for Revere, who uh, publicly spoke of and recorded his testimony of this man's contribution. A lot of tales have accumulated about Prescott. So the first one, and the one I think that's the most endearing, is that he was, why was he actually in Lexington until one in the morning and then riding home to Concord? That seems a little unusual, doesn't it? Well, the, the myth that has built up is that he was there courting his intended fiance, Lydia um, Mulliken, and that he had stayed long and had just left her at her family's home and was now coming back to Concord. That's a great story. It's very sweet. It's also completely based on thin air. There's no evidence that he ever courted her at all, much less that evening. And so we're left with even more questions than we have answers. Other people have speculated that, in fact, he must have been a party to the Sons of Liberty and that he was helping to patrol the countryside. Although the evidence for that is very thin as well. I, I mentioned before that Revere said that he that he was a high son of liberty, which is pretty good praise from Revere. But in the specific wording he used, he said, we found him to be a high son of liberty. What in the world does that mean? Did they have a secret handshake? And actually, they probably did. Secret societies were a big thing. We're not just talking about Freemasons in this era. A lot of these kinds of fraternal organizations had secret handshakes, secret signs, secret uh, pins that they would wear to let each other know. So who knows? Maybe he knew the secret handshake. The Sons of Liberty were so effectively secret, though, that we don't know any of those things about them particularly, which is very impressive. However they came to know that they could trust him, they trusted him. And his argument, which is how Revere describes it, that he could help them persuade the people of Concord was a true one. Dawes was a stranger to Concord. Revere had been there a couple of times in the prior weeks. But this was really an opportunity for a local to help them not only know how to get there and who to go wake up, but persuade people that it was time to sound a general alarm. The bottom line is the events of Patriot's Day, April 19th, 1775, would not have unfolded the way they did were it not for Dr. Samuel Prescott, this young man who took it upon himself to thrust himself into the events of history and is never really recorded for having done so. And that's why he makes for the perfect example for me of what I'm calling my Men of Freedom Project. He was crucial. 
Was he crucial because he was famous for what he did? Was he crucial because someone wrote a poem about him a hundred years later? No. He was crucial because he did what men do. Welcome to the year of living manly, by the way. For those of you who haven't been following my project, it's a year-long project to understand what makes men men. And in this project, I, I've reported on the results of a survey I conducted in March of 2021, where I surveyed hundreds of American men and found that 41% of them agree, five out of five on a scale of one to five, that they consider themselves very masculine. That's huge. It's not just some fringe of hyper-masculine types that we hear about in the media. These are men who, when we learn about everything else they do in their lives, they're happier, they're more committed to their relationships, they're more fruitful contributors to their communities. And that's exactly what these men of freedom are, or are trying to be, that I'm gonna talk about in this project, beginning with Dr. Samuel Prescott. If we want to be, or if we want more men to be, like the 41% of men whose lives are better and contribute more meaningfully to the lives of people around them, well, what do they have to be? How can they try to be like these men of freedom, like Dr. Samuel Prescott? Well, I've got four thoughts based on my data, much of which I've already shared in prior videos, but also based on his story. I mean, think about it. Number one, develop skills that can be useful. Number two, earn the trust of the people around you. Number three, respond when you are called to action, to serve people. And then four, be willing to take risks and make sacrifices to make all of that happen. I mean, that's a decent four-part recipe for being a very masculine man. My data support it, the life of Samuel Prescott supports it. If you wanna be more masculine, you do those things more. And he did exactly that, think about it. He developed the skills of a doctor so that it could be useful to his community. In being useful to his community, which his family had been there for generations, he was tied to them. They knew who he was, so much so that he could persuade them that danger was imminent. But he was also someone who could persuade Revere and Dawes that he could be helpful to them because he had demonstrated his faithfulness. And then, of course, he responded. Now, what's interesting about Prescott's case is that he didn't respond to anything. He was actually volunteering himself it's one o'clock in the morning, I see these two people on the road, I wanna help, I wanna be a part of this important moment. And then finally, willing to take risks. Think about watching Revere over here, just right at this spot here. Revere is standing here being held at gunpoint. Dawes turns the other way, don't blame him. Prescott says, let me ride over and see if I can help. And essentially initiates the events that allow him to escape and actually allow Revere to eventually get released by the soldiers and go back to Lexington, where he continues to be a part of the day's events. None of this would have happened without Dr. Samuel Prescott. So there's this question. If he was such a great man of freedom, why don't we know who he is? There's no poem. There's no statue that I can find. And actually, to me, that's precisely it. Because when you are let's call it, ready to take on the fifth step of being a more masculine man. You do all of these things without expectation that you will be recognized or rewarded for it. That's exactly what happened here. Your community needs you whether they will eventually praise and honor you for it or not. You do it because it's right. And that's my short tribute to a man who we know almost nothing about. A man who on this very road made a crucial difference. Just like millions of other men who have gone before, millions of men alive today who are doing what? Developing themselves so that they can be useful, taking risks, accepting the call to serve, putting themselves in a place where they have to sacrifice to serve their wives, their children, their families, their communities, and in this case, their fledgling nations. They don't need to be seen. They don't need to be praised. They don't need to be lauded. In a world today where we have politicians, pundits, other influencers who only want to be seen, maybe they don't even do anything, but they still want to be seen and recognized for it. Wouldn't it be amazing that in alongside the people who actually are doing the work, the Adamses, the Revere's, who are rightfully recognized for what they do, and I will be grateful for them. What if there were more of us willing to stand up and just be 
Dr. Samuel Prescott. All right, thanks for walking around this road with me. Next video, we're going to go back to Lexington. Remember, Revere and Dawes had already crossed through there. They had already told the citizens of Lexington that something was going to happen. And so they were now, at this very minute, standing ready on Lexington Common, waiting for 700 soldiers to come their way. There we're gonna learn about the second man of freedom I wanna focus on in this series. We'll see you there. And here we are, Lexington Common, where it all began, where first blood would be shed on that fateful morning, where the events that began here would reverberate all the way to Concord and then back down Battle Road to Boston, after which the Revolutionary War was begun.